it that even through all that beeping, you were able to recognize when you were being addressed, understand what was being said, and then respond accordingly. That's the central pillar in a project currently underway at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, CSAIL, an autonomous forklift, that is a forklift that's driverless, that operates via spoken commands. This is pokey. Every year in the U.S. alone, there are over 100 forklift-related deaths and 54,000 forklift-related accidents. Having a driverless forklift would decrease the danger to humans, but then raises the question of how do we get commands across to the forklift? Well, as alluded to earlier, speech is very natural to humans. We listen and process almost without thinking about it. Furthermore, speech is very flexible, more so than, say, a keyboard interface. Then, how can the forklift possibly understand when it is being commanded? We can use the solution of push to talk, in which a button is pushed to indicate the start and end times of a transmission, but this can be unwieldy. Say, for instance, I forgot to press transmit before yelling stop. This would be bad. So instead, we're using an open microphone setup in which the forklift is continuously listening, much like a human, or much like a human should be doing. This introduces, along with the great distance, a lot of signal degradation and background noise. One of the major sources of background noise is in fact caused by the forklift itself in the form of beeps, which are produced as a safety measure while the forklift backs up. In fact, those beeps are what you heard at the beginning of this presentation. We are going to focus on these beeps. So what are the differences between speech and beeps? First of all, speech has very unstable frequencies, whereas beeps, have stable frequencies, and what's more, are usually pretty loud. Speech is also usually broken into fairly short syllabic segments, whereas beeps are very long, especially for noises of stable frequency. Here are some images, if you will, of speech. The y-axis represents frequency, and the x-axis time. Observe that on the left-hand side, in the speech, the frequency wiggles all over the place. It's not stable at all. Also, the noise is fragmented into many short segments. Compared to the picture on the right, can you all find where the beeps are? Yes, more or less? That's right. They're the long, dark lines. They're long and dark because they're, they take a long time, and they're also very loud, because the darker the line is, the louder the sound is. So now let's go through the existing methods that have been used to try to filter out these beeps. First of all, we have filters, such as notch filters, which reject certain frequencies, and bandpass filters, which accept certain frequencies. The thing is, filters don't differentiate between the causes of frequencies, and the frequencies of beeps are very close to a critical range in human speech. In other words, the notch filter that was originally used rejected speech. Also, notch filters, by nature, assumed that the frequencies of the beeps would be fairly constant. But as we know, in reality, nothing is truly constant. And what's more, a month and a half ago at some demonstrations in Fort Lee, it was found that the heat actually affected machinery, thus changing the frequency of the beeps. So beeps were missed by the notch filter. We need a better way to identify beeps. Once we've identified beeps, we need to subtract them. What was used before is a method known as spectral subtraction, in which certain assumptions are made about the speech signal and the background noise signal, and parts of the spectrum are removed based on power. The thing is, this assumed that the background noise was actually white noise and subtracted speech. So we need a better way to reduce the beeps. Lastly, what does it actually mean to reduce the beep? We're going to define error as the power of the output or the sum of the amplitude squared of the output. We want to minimize this error. Now let's step through an overview of the process we've constructed. First again, we need to identify the beeps. We have a general idea of how to do this already because, again, beeps are fairly long chunks of noise with stable frequency. Then we need to subtract out a beep wave because we want to be able to work with a final output wave. For this, we need amplitude, frequency, and phase. Let's start out with beep identification. If we're given an initial waveform, we need to extract certain data from it. So we apply a Fourier transform, which converts time-based data into frequency-based data. Then we construct what's known as a spectrogram, which takes time and frequency to amplitude. And here's an example. You have a waveform on the left constructed into a spectrogram on the right. Now, to look for P 
peaks, which are frequencies of high amplitude in a certain slice of time, we can go through like this. Here's an exaggerated slice of time. We go through that slice of time, and we look for where the amplitude is highest. This is a peak. Beeps are basically formed of consecutive peaks. And since they're fairly long, we're going to look for, oops, sorry, say 30 peaks. Why 30? Well, empirically, it was found that a smaller number would classify some speech as beeps, and a larger number would miss some of the beeps. Now we move on to the estimates. For the amplitude estimate, we use what's known as a maximum likelihood estimator, which is essentially a scaling of the Fourier transform data. For the frequency, it gets a bit tricky, because sounds are sinusoids, and sinusoids are highly sensitive to changes in frequency. Here's an example. You can see that there's an input, which is this blue function, and we're trying to subtract out this offset, which is the black function. The difference is denoted by the dashed purple line. You'll see that on the right side, they're slightly off, but that slightly off is big enough that the difference is almost as large as the input. This is not good. We need to reassign or adjust the frequencies by means of this lovely equation, in which you take the imaginary portion of basically a synthesis of the data of a Fourier transform, time-adjusted Fourier transform, and the spectrogram data. And you can see the results of a, readjust, a reassigned spectrogram here. Notice that the data is much sharper. And here again, you can see that the two waves are now much closer to each other, and the difference is a lot smaller. So we have the frequency estimate. Now for the phase estimate, we need to make sure that waves match up enough that they subtract correctly. We basically cross-correlate the data over a series of shifts and see how they match up best, and we maximize the sum. That's an example of a waveform before this procedure was applied. Now compare it to this. So as you can see, there's still traces of the beeps left. But you can also hear that the power has been dramatically reduced. So again, for visual comparison, we have the two spectrograms. This procedure was tested over a large data set, and about 75% of the beeps were identified and removed or reduced. And in, over this data set, on average, the power was reduced by about 85%. Why were 25% of the beeps not identified? Well, recall that we were looking for consecutive peaks. However, like humans, Pokey can also get distracted. The microphones on top of the forklift might sometimes have shifted in the direction of speech in the middle of his own beeps, thereby interrupting his beeps and causing each portion to be too short to be identified correctly. So we can come up with an improvement in beep identification, perhaps by introducing an algorithm which uses data already known about the approximate frequencies of the beeps and the locations and the spacings of these beeps. We can also increase the amount of power reduction by treating the output waveform as a sort of input waveform in which the frequencies, more or less, are known and the approximate locations are also known. Lastly, we can also extend this application to lots of other uses in removing and reducing active noise if we treat this active noise as combinations of stable frequency noises. Finally, I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Jim Glass from CSAIL. I'd like to thank Ekapong Transplanet for all his help in this project. I'd like to thank my tutor, Jenny Sendova and Nate Thomas for helping me through this paper and project. Also, Jacob Hurwitz, Kate Rudolph, and Kartik Venkatram for their help in this presentation. Stephen Shum, Najim Dehak, Scott Cyphers, and Marcia Davidson for all their encouragement. My fellow Rickoids for their camaraderie. My family for care and counsel and my sponsors, SAP America and MIT, RSI, and CEE for providing me with such an amazing research experience. Thank you all for your attention. Do we have any questions from the audience, or the judges, I guess, get first priority? Yes. The algorithm, is it a uh, batch processing algorithm or an incremental algorithm? The question that I need to repeat in the microphone is um, whether it's a batch processing algorithm or an incremental algorithm. Um, I'm afraid I don't quite understand. Would you please clarify what you mean by batch versus incremental? Uh, 
when you're processing the speech, you have to have a large collection of speech and then you post process it, or is this a real time algorithm that can identify the beeps as they go along? It's post processing. We haven't extended this application to live processing, if you will. Did you speculate about how you might modify the algorithm to work incrementally? Mm. That's interesting. I suppose you could do some sort of adaptive filtering in which you, if you have an approximate idea of when the beeps are starting up, then you could listen for the frequency of the beeps and try to subtract it as you're going along, adjust those estimates as you go, and see if that does any good. Another que question from a judge? I suppose by one thing, the beeps are coming in from the forklift, right? That's correct. So doesn't it know when it's even? Is this just a test case? Or I'm not sure if I'm missing something or if this is just sort of a test case or something you might want to apply to other things later. No, it the didn't question is um, that the beeps are coming from the forklift, so wouldn't the forklift know when it's beeping? And is this a test case for other things you might use in the future? Uh, no, it's not a test case. The forklift does indeed know when it's beeping, but that doesn't change the fact that we have to remove these beeps. Question. So you're trying to remove the beast because you want to do speech recognition on the other end of it. Have you done any study of how well this noise removal affects the accuracy of your speech recognition? And in fact, how good is that accuracy? The question is that the beep removal is so that you can do speech recognition afterwards, and how good is the speech recognition, um, and how accurate is that? <coughs> Um, unfortunately, due to time constraints, I myself was not able to go through and see how speech recognition was affected by this. However, I did look through the spectrogram data before and after and saw that none of the speech, as far as I can tell, was removed. Are there questions from the audience? All right, then if there's no more questions, thank you very much.